So this is another reading of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, <laughs> like audiobooks, sort of. Anyway, I will start with a um, chant, the meditation on Sri Ramakrishna. Om Hridaya Kamala Madhye Rajitam Nirvikalpam Sada Sada Kila Beda Tika Meka Swarupam Prakriti Vikriti Shunyam Nityam Ananda Murtim Vimala Paramahamsam Rama Krishnam Bajamaha Nirupa Mamati Shukshmam Nishprapancham Nirhiham Gagana Sadrisham Isham Sarva Bhuta Divasam Triguna Rahita Satchit Brahma Rupam Varanyam Vimala Paramaham Sam Ramakrishnam Bajamaha Vitaritumavatirnam Yana Bhakti Prashanti Pranaya Galata Chittam Jiva Dukha Sahishnum Dritta Saja Samadim Chinmayam Komalangam Vimala Paramaham Sam Ramakrishnam Bajama. The meditation on Sri Ramakrishna. This knower of Brahman, ever established in his own nature, full of wisdom, self possessed and self lighted, eternal the very image of that Brahman who is pure bliss, shining ceaselessly in the lotus of the heart, one alone and without parts, pure and still. This Ramakrishna, Paramatman Supreme, we adore. Subtle, fine and luminous, not even the shadow of the gross can ever reach him, for his purity is without parallel. Untouched by Maya's webs of deceit, beyond the dark rivers of time and desire, vast as the sky, this Supreme Lord, the very essence of Brahman as existence and light, this Ramakrishna, Paramatman Supreme, we adore. Saturated with divine consciousness, his home is in all. He hears every cry. He knows every pain. Under the weight of its compassion, his heart can deny the need of none. Born to raise the world with teachings of knowledge, love, and peace. Born to bring mankind fresh songs of joy. This certain refuge of all, this Ramakrishna, Paramahamsam, Paramatman Supreme, we adore. So we are in the middle of a chapter. It's um, on page 325 is where I'm going to start. And the chapter's name is The, La the Last Visit to Keshav, and it's chapter 15. Um, what I've been doing is sharing a few uh, quotes about the young boy disciples, or, or actually I did one on Baba Tarini Ma too, and, and um, some of the women who met Sri Ramakrishna and who were present around this time. This is when they came. Many of his uh, disciples first met Sri Ramakrishna right about the time that this gospel, um, the, what we read here, was taking place. Often in these meetings, they will go to someone's house, and many of them, these disciples, met Sri Ramakrishna there. And I like to give just a little background because um, sometimes you get a different picture of Sri Ramakrishna, and it gives you something to meditate on 
um, also as to how th they met him, what he first told them, and what he looked like even. So this time I've t taken um, just a little bit from Swami Turiyananda, whose name was Harinath, and just his first coming to the Master. There's a whole lot more in his life, of course. He actually came to this country, was a um, person who lived at Shanti Ashram, and uh, many of the Western disciples met him, too, as Swami Turiyananda. He went back to India, and he actually died in Varanasi. He lived there, too, for some time. Anyway, Harinath met Ramakrishna for the first time at Dinanath Basu's house in Bhagwazar, Calcutta. He was then 13 or 14 years old. So they're just young boys when they come to him. Harinath watched as Hridai helped Ramakrishna get down from a horse carriage. The master was in ecstasy. Later, Harinath wrote about his first impression. The master appeared very thin. He had a shirt on, and his cloth was securely tied around his waist. One of his feet was on the step of the carriage, and the other was inside. He, had, he was in a semi-conscious state. When he got down, what a wonderful sight. There was an indescribable radiance over his whole face. I thought, I have heard from the scriptures about the great sage Sukadev. Is he the same Sukadev? Then Ramakrishna was taken to the second floor of Dinanath Basu's house, and Harinath followed him. Regaining a little consciousness of the outer world, the master saw a portrait of Mother Kali on the wall, and he bowed down to her, and then thrilled the audience by singing a song describing the oneness of Krishna and Kali. Gradually, Harinath became familiar with Ramakrishna and began to ask him all sorts of personal questions. Sir, he asked one day, how can one become free from lust completely? Ramakrishna replied, why should it go, my boy? Give it a turn in another direction. What is lust? It is the desire to get. So desire to get God and strengthen this desire greatly. Sri Ramakrishna's way of teaching was simple, natural, and very effective. He did not ask his disciples to mortify themselves. He said, the more you go toward the east, the farther you will be away from the west. The more you increase your love for God, the more your lust, anger, and jealousy will decrease. Young Harinath received specific instructions on meditation and other spiritual disciplines from the master. Sir, he asked one day, how does one become aware of the dawn of knowledge? Sri Ramakrishna replied, a man does not jump about when he gets illumination. Outwardly, he remains as he was, but his entire perspective of the world is changed. A touch of the philosopher's stone turns a steel sword into gold. It retains the former's shape, but it can no longer kill. It has become soft. Harinath studied the Vedanta, and one day the master said to him, what is there in scriptures? They're like sheets of paper with a shopping list on them. The list is used to check off items once they've been purchased. So you should check your knowledge, your devotion, and consult the scriptures to see whether they agree or not. One day, the master said, what is the teaching of Vedanta? Is it not that Brahman alone is real and the world is unreal? Isn't that its substance? Or does it say something else? Then why don't you give up the unreal? and cling to the real. This was the turning point in Harinath's life. So that's just a little view of Sri Ramakrishna from one of his intimate disciples. So here we are on page 3, 
25, I'm going back just slightly so we can lead into where we were. A neighbor. Sir, why should one hold on to God with one hand and the world with the other? Why should one ever even stretch out one hand to hold on to the world if it is impermanent? Master, the world is not impermanent if one lives there after knowing God. Listen to a song. O oh mind, you do not know how to farm. Follow lies the field of your life. If you had only worked it well, how rich a harvest you might reap. Hedge it about with Kali's name, if you would keep your harvest safe. This is the stoutest hedge of all, for death himself cannot come near it. Did you listen to the song? Hedge it about with Kali's name, if you would keep your harvest safe. Surrender yourself to God and you will achieve everything. This is the stoutest hedge of all, for death himself cannot come near it. Yes, it is a strong hedge indeed. If you but realize God, you won't see the world as unsubstantial. He who has realized God knows that God himself has become the world and all living beings. When you feed your child, you should feel that you're feeding God. You should look on your father and mother as veritable manifestations of God and the Divine Mother and serve them as such. If a man enters the world after realizing God, he does not generally keep up physical relations with his wife. Both of them are devotees. They love to talk only of God and pass their time in spiritual conversation. They serve other devotees of God, for they know that God alone has become all living beings. And knowing this, they devote their lives to the service of others. Neighbor. But sir, such a husband and wife are not to be found anywhere. Master, yes, they can be found, though they may be very rare. Worldly people can't recognize them. In order to lead such a life, both the husband and wife must be spiritual. It is possible to lead a life if both of them have a taste of the bliss of God. God's special grace is necessary to create such a couple. Otherwise, there will always be misunderstanding between them. In that case, the one has to leave the other. Life becomes very miserable if a husband and wife do not agree. The wife will say to her husband day and night, why did my father marry me to such a person? I can't get enough to eat or feed my children. I haven't clothes enough to cover my body or to give to my children. I have, haven't received a single piece of jewelry from you. How happy have you made me? Ah, you keep your eyes closed and mutter the name of God. Now do give up all these silly ideas. Devotee, there are such obstacles, certainly. Besides, the children may be disobedient. Then there's no end of difficulties. Now, sir, what is the way? Master. It is extremely difficult to practice spiritual discipline and at the same time lead the householder's life. There are many handicaps, disease, grief, poverty, misunderstanding with one's wife, disobedient and stupid or stubborn children. I don't have to give you the list of them, but still there's a way out. One should pray to God going now and then into solitude and make efforts to realize him. Neighbor, must one leave home then? Master, no, not altogether. Whenever you have the leisure, go into solitude for a day or two 
At that time, you don't have any, don't have any relations with the outside world and don't hold any conversation with worldly people on worldly affairs. You must live either in solitude or in the company of holy men. Neighbor, how can one recognize a holy man? Master, he who has surrendered his body, mind, and innermost self to God is surely a holy man. He who has renounced woman and gold surely is a holy man. He is a holy man who does not regard woman with the eyes of a worldly person. He never forgets to look upon a woman as his mother and to offer her his worship if he happens to be near her. The holy man constantly thinks of God and does not indulge in any talk except about spiritual things. Furthermore, he serves all beings, knowing that God resides in everybody's heart. These are generally, these are in general, the signs of a holy man. Um, it's interesting because Swami Chariyananda, one of the first things he said to Sri Ramakrishna was that he didn't like women and he didn't even want to look at them. And Sri Ramakrishna gave him this same advice to look on all women as the Divine Mother, which is, of course, what he did. I mean, he, he looked at him, on himself as a child in relation to women. Neighbor. Must one always live in solitude? Master, haven't you seen the trees on the footpath along the street? They're fenced around as long as they're very young. Otherwise, the cattle will destroy them. But there is no longer any near need of fences when their trunks grow thick and strong. Then they won't break even if an elephant is tied to them. Just so, there will be no need for you to worry and fear if you make your mind strong as a thick tree trunk. First of all, try to acquire discrimination. Break the jackfruit open only after you have rubbed your hands with oil. Then its sticky milk won't smear them. Neighbor, what is discrimination? Master, discrimination is the reasoning by which one knows that God alone is real and all else is unreal. Real means eternal and unreal means impermanent. He who has acquired discrimination knows that God is the only substance and all else is non-existent. With the awakening of this spirit of discrimination, a man wants to know God. On the contrary, if man loves the unreal, such things as creature comforts, name, fame, and wealth, then he doesn't want to know God, who is of the very nature of reality. Through discrimination between the real and the unreal, one seeks to know God. We just read that section where he talked about this um, type of discrimination because Swami Chariyananda was a great reader of Vedanta. He studied a whole lot of the scriptures. And that is like sharpening your discrimination. There's actually more than one kind of discrimination. They, the discrimination between the real and the unreal, which is sadasat vastu viveka, which is what he's referring to here. But there also are other kinds of discrimination that we use every day, like um, the discrimination to what I should do and kara and akara, vastu viveka, what I should do and what I shouldn't do, that kind of discrimination. We have to make those type of dis um, decisions all the time. And it's it's the first thing that they list that's necessary uh, for a sadhu is discrimination 
And then they say, once you've discriminated between things and you understand that it, God is real, then you renounce, and that's vairagya, that's the second thing. And then there's like this extrasures and this burning desire for liberation is also part of it. So then Ramakrishna goes on to say, listen to a song. Come, let us go for a walk, O mind, to Kali, the wish-fulfilling tree. And there, beneath it, gather the four fruits of life. Of your two wives, dispassion and worldliness, bring along dispassion only on your way to the tree and ask her son discrimination about the truth. By turning the mind within oneself, one acquires discrimination. And through discrimination, one thinks of truth. That's why it's called sat asat vastu viveka, between the real and the unreal. And satya, of course, is the room word for truth. Then the mind feels the desire to go for a walk to Kali, the wish-fulfilling tree. Reasoning, re when you reach in, reaching that tree, that is to say, going near God, you can without any effort gather the four fruits, dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. Yes, after realizing God, one can also get, if one desires, dharma, artha, kama, which means are necessary for leading the worldly life. So that's um, righteous action, and artha would be wealth and things like that, and kama are desires. And these are considered to be the four fruits of uh, Life. They're the four goals that people go after in this birth. We all take birth because we have some desire. So it's um, turning that and discriminating between what is real and unreal, he tells us. Mahaji, why would why on the three fruits when you get the moksha fruit? Yeah, the moksha fruit is the, the one that we're going, really going for. But most people are going for those three. That's what the world is. Akku uh, says, should they desire having gotten all four? Should they desire the tree, they can get all four. And why not only get the one? And if they get that one, they won't want the other three. Huh? No, they won't. The other three will fall off. And that's why, he, I mean, when he says this, that it's possible um, for you to get the other three if you discriminate and you, you know, regulate your life, if you so desire. But it means you're going to be lead, leading a, a worldly life. And as Nishan was saying, you're not going to want to if you, if you go to the fourth, which is the moksha, the freedom. Master, as long as one has not realized God, one should, rena one should renounce the world following the process of nati nati. But he who has attained God knows that it is God who has become all this. Then he sees that God, maya, Living beings and the universe form one whole. God includes the universe and its living beings. Suppose you have separated the shell, flesh, and seeds of a bell fruit, and someone asks you the weight of the fruit. Will you leave aside the shell and the seeds and weigh only the flesh? Not at all. To know the real weight of the fruit, you must weigh the whole of it. 
The shell may be likened to the universe, the seeds to living beings. While one is engaged in discrimination, one says to oneself that the universe and the living beings are non-self and unsubstantial. At that time, one thinks of the flesh alone as the substance and the shell and seeds as unsubstantial. But after discrimination is over, one feels that all three parts of the fruit together form a unity. Then one further realizes that the stuff that has produced the flesh of the fruit has also produced the shell and the seeds. To know the real nature of the bell fruit, one must know all three. So this is the Vigyana state, which is what Sri Ramakrishna lived in when he could see um, Sarvam Kalvyadam Brahma, that everything was Brahman. So he no longer had the need to reject things of the world. It became like a mansion of mirth. It is the process of evolution and involution. The world, after its dissolution, remains involved in God, and God at the time of creation evolves as the world. Butter goes with buttermilk, and buttermilk goes with butter. If there's a thing called buttermilk, then butter also existed, and if there's a thing called butter, then buttermilk also exists. If the self exists, then the non-self must also exist. The phenomenal world belongs to that very reality to which the absolute belongs. Again, the absolute belongs to that very reality to which this phenomenal world belongs. He who is realized as God has also become the universe and its living beings. One who knows the truth knows that it is he alone who has become father and mother, child and neighbor, man and animal, good and bad, holy and unholy, and so forth. Neighbor. Then there is no virtue and no sin Master, they both exist and they do not exist. If God keeps the ego in a man, then he keeps in him the sense of differentiation and also the sense of virtue and sin. But in a rare few, he completely effaces the ego. And these go beyond virtue and sin, good and bad. As long as a man has not realized God, he remains, he retains this sense of differentiation and the knowledge of the good and the bad. You may say virtue and sin are the same to me. I'm only doing what God bids me. But you know in your heart that these are mere words. No sooner do you commit an evil deed than you feel palpitation in your heart. Even after God has been realized, he keeps in the mind of devotee, if he so desires, the feeling of the servant ego. So in that state, the devotee says, O oh God, thou art the master, and I am thy servant. Such a devotee enjoys only spiritual talk and spiritual deeds. He does not enjoy the company of the ungodly people. He does not care for any work that is not of a holy nature. So you see, God keeps a sense of differentiation, even in such a devotee. Neighbor, you ask us, sir, to live in the world after knowing God. Can God really become known? Master, God cannot be known by the sense organs or by the mind but he can be known by the pure mind, the pure mind that is free from worldly desires. In other places, 
he also says that the pure mind is Brahman. So it's actually within yourself if you attain the complete purity because then the little self, which is the obstruction, disappears. Neighbor, who can know God? Master, right, who can really know him? But as for us, it's enough to know as much of him as we need. What need of I have a whole, a whole well of water? One jar is more than enough for me. An ant went to a sugar hill. Did it need the entire hill? One grain or two of sugar was more than enough. Neighbor, sir, we are like typhoid patients. How can we be satisfied with one jar of water? We feel like knowing the whole of God. Master, that is true. But there is also medicine for the typhoid patient. Neighbor, what is that medicine, sir? Master, the company of holy men, repeating the name of God, singing his glories, and unceasing prayer. I pray to the Divine Mother, Mother, I don't seek knowledge. Here, take thy knowledge, take thy ignorance, give me only pure love for thy lotus feet. I didn't ask her for anything else. As is the disease, so must the remedy be. The Lord says in the Gita, O Arjuna, take refuge in me. I shall deliver you from all sin. Take shelter at his feet. He will give you right understanding. He will take the entire responsibility for you. Then you will get rid of the typhoid. Can one ever know God without such a mind as this? Can one pour four seers of milk in a one seer pot? Can one ever know God unless he lets us know him? Therefore I say, take shelter in God. Let him do whatever he likes. He is self-willed. What power is there in a man? So this is the end of the, that particular chapter. So does anybody have any question at this point? It's not, I mean, to say God is real, but affirmation is not very Vedantic, you know? so it's more like an intuitive kind of, it seems like vairagya must come before Viveka. One must be pushed away from the world towards something, but not know what that something is. Well, they, usually it's listed that Viveka comes first, and then, the, then you renounce, because once you see the difference between the real and the unreal, you want the, what is real, and that, that's what drives you for that renunciation. But what makes you discriminate in the first place are, in one sense, this is the great quality that a man has, the great opportunity, because we have that capacity, that mental capacity of discrimination. And we're, as I said, there are, there are different kinds of discrimination, and you are doing it all the time from the time that you're very small. You're discriminating between this and that. But when you get to the point of saying, not this, not, not this, and you begin to see that all of it, none of it really stands, that's when you really renounce, because it, it pushes you to that extreme. It's not a one and done sort of thing. It's like a flickering Viveka. No? Sometimes you feel like, yes, it's true. I'm Atman. I cannot be this change. And other times you're like, I don't know anything else but this one. Yeah. But that's because we're aspirants and we're struggling. But if it becomes very strong, if you get that, what's called mumukshutwa, then you can't sleep. I mean, then it becomes like a burning desire for liberation. They say it's like a person whose hair is on fire and how they run to the water, you know, in order to put it out. They, they're not thinking of anything else. It's just this, um, there's no choice.
anymore. It's not your choice. That's what I always feel is that it's not really your choice. And what he says is take refuge in God, you know, surrender to God. He repeatedly tells people that. Because somebody like King Janaka is very unusual. I mean, he was a knower of Brahman, and then he lived like a king in the world. And this, that's just like one in, you know, he's still the example. <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's, most of us are not anywhere near that. So it's a matter of struggling. But you can sharpen your discrimination by trying to see, as he described there, with your that your family, they are God, you know, or people that you meet, they are God. You know, all of this is part of the divine play. And if you can try to look on it that way, there are actually states where people see this. Um, Swami Ashokananda, in his um, Meditation, Illumination, and Ecstasy book. In there, he gives an example of somebody who begins to see their chosen ideal in everybody. And so you're looking, and I mean, can you imagine that? It makes my hair feel like it's going to stand. And it, if you saw that that was your chosen ideal in front of you, I mean, it would be very hard to, f to do anything. I mean, to me, the whole... If you could really see that it was God, I don't know how you could act in the world because it would be such a blissful, you know, experience. It would be, but there's some um, different practices that you can do that that can help you to see that and imagining that. There was one woman that Sri Ramakrishna talked to that said that she couldn't meditate on God. And then he said, well, who do you love? And she said, her little nephew, you know. And he said, well, then think of him as God and take him as, you know, meditate on him and try to serve him. And through that practice itself, she was able to, you know, make a lot of spiritual practice. So it's, what do you love? You know, where is your heart? That's... Yeah. Like, you just have to wait until the Shakti part, and then you'll be like, okay, there's... Well, you, but you have to prepare yourself. You can't just sit there doing nothing. It's not going to happen. I mean, it might, but the chances are that it's not going to happen. That's why we do spiritual practices, is to try to purify ourselves so that we can see that because it's always there it's always inside of you the grace is always there and it is unconditional because there in the ultimate sense there is no subject and object to grace or to divine love it's unconditional because there's not a thou and a me it's all one thing what you enter into or knowledge it's the same thing you enter into something that is oneness. Can you pray? Like, you know, he says, pray yeah. But if I, if I pray unceasingly during all of my worldly stuff, and I bring God into like the stuff that is maybe impure, that I don't necessarily want to be doing, no, because praying unceasingly, usually when they speak of that, what they're talking about is doing japa. Oh. Like, you know, there's that, um, the prayer of the pilgrim. Way of the pilgrim. Yeah, way of the pilgrim. He's all the time, he's, he's doing this prayer inside of himself. He's praying unceasingly. Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, have mercy on me. So um, we also have a belief in that, that you can, actually there are people who when they uh, fall asleep at night, they're doing that, and when they wake up in the morning, that's what's going on. And 
usually when they say pray unceasingly, that's what they mean. But there is a prayer where you can just, you can be praying for something, you know, um, to see God or to please help me, you know, realize, you know, the truth or even the Gayatri Mantra. It's a wonderful one. Um, make my understanding, you know, right understanding. So all those things are prayers, and they can be going on all the time, and it, it's not going to harm your discrimination if that's in the background, because that actually, they say it's like a chain, and each one that you pull, it's pulling you toward God, you know. So it's um, going on in the background all the time. is actually purifying you, and it will actually sharpen your discrimination rather than, you know, decrease it. It's going to make it more. So the next chapter is chapter 16. With the devotees at Dakshin Eswar. Sunday, December 9th, 1883. Sri Ramakrishna was seated on a small couch in his room with Adar Manomohan Rakal M. Harish and the other devotees. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. The master was describing to them the exalted state of Sri Chaitanya. Well, this just reminded me that if you go to M's house in um, Calcutta, he has this picture of Chaitanya there. And Sri Ramakrishna said that he saw M, who is the author of this book, as be one of the devotees in Chaitanya's group in an earlier um, thing. So that's there. And also, when it said he had on a coat, there's a green coat that they have that was his, the Sri Ramakrishna's actual coat that you can see there if you go. His grandson recently passed away. He uh, used to run that house. I'm not sure who's running it now, but it's still there. And it's wonderful. You can climb way up to the top, you know, and you can get up on the roof and where Sri Ramakrishna called for his <laughs> disciples. And they have his shoes there. Some One pair of his shoes are there. Anyhow, it's a beautiful thing. OK, so we're on Chaitanya. Master, Chaitanya experience three states of mind. First, the conscious state, when his mind dwelt on the gross and the subtle. Second, the semi-conscious state, when his mind entered the causal body and was absorbed in the bliss of divine intoxication. Third, the innermost state, when his mind was merged in the great cause. This agrees very well with the five koshas, or sheaths, described in Vedanta. The gross body corresponds to the anamaya kosha and the pranamaya kosha. The subtle body is the manamaya kosha and the vijnanamaya kosha. And the causal body is the anandamaya kosha. The mahakarana, the great cause, is beyond the five shes. When Chaitanya's mind merged in that, he would go into samadhi. This is called the nirvakalpa, or jata samadhi. While conscious of the outer world, Chaitanya sang the name of God. While in the state of partial consciousness, he danced with the devotees. And while in the state of consciousness, he remained absorbed in samadhi. M, to himself. Is the master hinting at the different states of his own mind? There is much similarity between Chaitanya and the master. Master, Chaitanya was divine love incarnate. He came down to earth to teach people how to love God. One achieves everything when one loves God. There is no need of hatha yoga. A devotee, sir, what is hatha yoga like? Master, a man practicing hatha yoga dwells a great deal on his body. He washes his intestines by means of a bamboo tube through the anus. 
He draws ghee and milk through his sexual organ. He learns how to manipulate his tongue by performing exercises. He sits in a fixed posture, and now and then he levitates. All these are actions of the prana. A magician was performing his feats when his tongue turned up and clove to the roof of his mouth. Immediately, his body became motionless. People thought he was dead. He was buried and remained so for many years in the grave. After a long time, the grave somehow broke open and suddenly the man regained consciousness of the world and cried out, come delusion, come confusion. Everybody laughed. All these are actions of the prana. The Vedantists do not accept Hatha Yoga. There is also Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga describes how to achieve union with God through the mind by means of discrimination and bhakti. This yoga is good. Hatha Yoga is not good. The life of a man in the Kali Yuga is depend on food. The reason he didn't like it was because it was so body oriented and it, he thought that it just made you more aware of your body. Sri Ramakrishna was standing in the road by the side of the Nahabat. He was on his way to his room, having come from the pine grove. He saw M seated on the veranda of the Nahabat, behind the fence, absorbed in meditation. Master, hello, you are here. You will get results very soon. If you practice a little, then someone will come forward to help you. M looked up at the master, startled. He remained sitting on the floor. Master, the time is ripe for you. The mother bird does not break the shell of the egg until the right time comes. What I told you is indeed your ideal. Ramakrishna again mentioned to M his spiritual ideal. Swami Shivananda once um, said he became the president of the order, but he once said that when people came to him, he would see first their chosen ideal, and then slowly it would merge into whoever the, the devotee was, and he'd see the ideal in their heart. So these people have um, real insight into, you know, I mean, a spiritual teacher can tell you who your ideal is. Yeah, well, um, sure, even Vivekananda got the Ram not mantra from Sri Ramakrishna, and so did many other. He would write them on the tongue. You know, that was his way of doing it. People have different ways. Some people, they, it, what is called Shakti, where you're touched and you can feel something, you know, entering into you. I think Ramakrishna actually did that also with some people. But we remember we read that section earlier about Naranjana Ananda and when he was first initiated and how the mantra kept going for like three days and he got really scared. He thought he was going crazy and he had to go back. He went back to Sri Ramakrishna and so then he kind of, you know, stroked his heart and said, okay, go down low, you know, so that he wouldn't be just completely because it was so intense. But yes, no, I mean, Ramakrishna himself didn't give his name to people. He gave you know, different ma mantras to different people, I think. Gopal or Mon, those, you know, got Krishna mantras. But his, his way often was that writing on the tongue. But I just think it's interesting because they can tell who your ideal is. And some people, I have another one, maybe next time when I'll do it, I'll read it. Um, of Sardananda where he thinks he has a particular chosen ideal and Ramakrishna says, no, that's not right. You know, this is your ideal. You know, so that's interesting too because he himself didn't know who it was. So, Sri Ramakrishna again mentioned to him his spiritual ideal. 
Master, it is not necessary for all to practice great austerity, but I went through great suffering. I used to lie on the ground with my head resting on a mound for a pillow. I hardly noticed the passing of the days. I only called on God and wept, Mother, oh Mother. M had been visiting Sri Ramakrishna for the past two years. Since he had been educated along English lines, he had acquired a fondness for Western philosophy and science and liked to hear Keshav and other scholars lecture. Sri Ramakrishna would address him now and then as the Englishman. Since coming to Sri Ramakrishna, M had lost all relish for lectures and for books written by English scholars. The only thing that appealed to him now was to see the master day and night and hear the words that fell from his blessed lips. M constantly dwelt on, dwelt on certain of the Sri Ramakrishna's sayings. The master had said, quote, one can certainly see God through the practice of spiritual discipline. And again, the vision of God is the only goal in human life. I remember once we had a whole group of swamis come to the convent. It was at a time when some people were taking vows. And we asked them what's the most important thing in spiritual life. And they gave all kinds of things about monastic life. I mean, because they, we were a group of nuns and we were asking about it. And one of them said, it's to realize God. And I went, I went, hooray, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know because, because they were like missing the big point and, you know, giving us the details, you know, which was good. But still, it was interesting out of all 12 of them, only one said that. OK, um, so the vision of God is the only goal of human life, Ramakrishna said. Master to M. If you practice only a little, someone will come forward and tell you the right path. Observe the Ekadashi. So he wanted him to practice Ekadashi. A lot of Indian women especially practice Ekadashi. It's a fasting on a certain, you know, eight days after the fourth night of the moon or something rather. You, huh? 11. 11, okay. Yeah, we have a girl that does in the convent that. But she, you know, has been brought up doing that. And I remember when I lived in India, you know, many people would do that. But of course, there's different kind of fasting, too. If some people, if you just don't eat rice, that's a fast. <laughs> you can have as many luchis as you want. Yeah. It's like started fasting after breakfast. <laughs> yeah, after breakfast. That's true. <laughs> But some people are quite good at it. You know, they don't, yeah. you know, they can, you can learn. I mean, your body learns. You train your body. And it, you know, has its, um, it's good for some people, but you need to talk to your teacher about it before you get too carried away. There's a story about St. Francis, too, and he used to fast. And um, there was some, he had a disciple who was trying to imitate everything he did. And he started trying to do, you know, even more and more. And finally, St. Francis had to stop fasting. <laughs> you know, he had to reduce his fasting so that this guy wouldn't kill himself <laughs> off because he couldn't do it. You know, he wasn't in the same uh, thing, but it was funny. <laughs> funny. He had to reduce his austerity oh. just because his disciple was imitating him. Okay. <laughs> So, you are my very own, my relative. Otherwise, why should I come here so frequently? While listening to the kirtan, I had a vision of Rakal in the midst of Sri Krishna's companions in Brindavan. Narendra belongs to a very high level. Here in Ananda, too, how childlike his nature is. What a sweet disposition he has. I want to see him, too. Once I saw the companions of Chaitanya, not in a trance, but with these very eyes. Formerly, I was in such an exalted state of mind that I could see all these things with my naked eyes, but now I see them in samadhi. I saw 
the companions of Chaitanya with these naked eyes, I think I saw you there too, and Balaram. You must have noticed that when I see certain people, I jump with a kind of start. Do you know why? A man feels that way when he sees his own people after a very long time. I used to pray to the mother, crying, Mother, if I do not find the devotees, I will surely die. Please bring them to me immediately. In those days, whatever desires arose in my mind would come to pass. I planted a Tulsi grove in the Panchabati in order to practice japa and meditation. I wanted very much to fence it around with bamboo sticks. Soon afterward, a bundle of bamboo sticks and some string were carried by the flood tide of the Ganges right in front of the Panchabati. The temple servant noticed them and joyfully told me. In that state of divine exaltation, I could no longer perform the formal worship. Mother, I said, who will look after me? I haven't the power to take care of myself. I want to listen only to talk about thee. I want to feed thy devotees. I want to give a little help to those whom I chance to meet. How will all that be possible, Mother? Give me a rich man to stand by me. That is why Mathur Babu came, and he served me. I said further, certainly I shall not have any children, Mother, but it is my desire that a boy with sincere love for God should always remain to me. Give me such a boy. And that is the reason Rakal came here. Those whom I think of as my own are part and parcel of me. We, we read about um, Swami Premananda coming and how pure he was too. And, he, and he, how Sri Ramakrishna would cry when, when he had to go back to Calcutta. That was really moving to me because I hadn't read it before and I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> he really loved them. Anyway, I'm going to end um, here. Does anybody else have anything they want to say? All right, we did talk a little, so Maha Yoga Nanda should be pleased. <laughs> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamataya Purnameva Vasishate Om Shanti 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 Filled with Brahman are the things we see. Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman all, yet is he still the same.